Bueno, Wolfram, bienvenidísimo a este ciclo de Atrévete a pensar. Eh, filosofía eh, para, para estos, estos tiempos que estamos viviendo, que no sabemos si son buenos o malos, de eso hablaremos ahora también. Eh, me hace mucha ilusión estar aquí contigo, además... Eh, cerca, eh, cerca de un día que el calendario señala como el día de la filosofía. Entonces, una de las primeras cosas que me gustaría preguntarte, quizá para romper un poco el hielo, es ¿es necesario un día de la filosofía? I really don't believe much in the importance of, of such days, but it is important to live every day with philosophy. So if that's serves as a reminder that philosophy is with us and amongst us every day, that's a good thing. Um, but I understand the symbolic, symbolic value of such a thing, but, um, uh, and I applaud the effort, but I, I really think uh, it, would, it would serve us well to understand that philosophy is not somewhere at the ivory tower or somewhere in the academia, but whenever we open our mouths to discuss things that are important to us and others, we do have philosophy amongst us, and that's an important thing to see and to acknowledge. Pues, eh, precisamente, uno de, las, de los temas en los que siempre pienso cuando pienso en ti y cuando pienso en, tu, eh, en esta difusión también fuera de la academia, ¿no? de, de la filosofía, es en, en, el, en, en cómo has escrito tú, tanto en Tiempo de Magos como en El Fuego de la Libertad, cómo has escrito sobre eh, unas figuras que son importantísimas en su ámbito, eh, incluso más allá en el ámbito literario, en el ámbito casi político, ¿no? eh, pero unas figuras eh, de las que precisamente unas, unos, unos años de esas figuras que no conocíamos tanto. El tiempo de magos se centra en 1919-1929 y el fuego de la libertad en el 33 y en el 43. Me centro en esos años porque es cuando estos autores eran muy jóvenes. Eh, eran muy jóvenes, estaban en los inicios, la mayoría, ¿no? un poco de sus, de sus carreras. Eh, y, 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 y como decía, una de las cosas eh, que más ilusión me hace ¿no? eh, pensando en estos libros es como tú también reivindicas, o creo que reivindicas, ese papel eh, de la juventud eh, en, el, en, el, en el trabajo del pensamiento. ¿Nos podrías hablar un poco de, de esto? See, yes, I mean, really, uh, when we think of philosophers, you know, in a classical sense, we usually think of very old men with a long beard uh, who are in their 70s or 80s. And we have this image of people creating new thought. But that is not true. It's not true for the biography of these philosophers. It is generally not true for humankind. I think if people have a, an impetus for philosophy or thinking in general, the big steps Uh, in their in their thinking, they they come about when they're 30 or 40 or even younger. Uh, so first of all, it's in a way uh, 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 a step in the politics of representation to think of a philosopher as a young human being and not an old one. I think that would do a great favor to our culture. The second thing is, of course, that uh, four of the philosophers of my book are also women. Um, so I think there's right now in our culture a really sound mix a much sounder mix when it comes to the ratio of male and female and most importantly i write books and i'm i guess probably a bit more of a writer than a philosopher in that sense who focus on the transformational power of philosophy for everyday life for your own biography there's a way to think about philosophy as a as a science uh, maybe the art of giving the right reasons or coming up with the right reasons for your own or someone else's behavior But philosophy also is a transformational art. It really can revolutionize and change the way you live. You see yourself, the world you live in, and you see the others that you share this world with. And, and this third part uh, is something that is very interesting and dear to me. And usually in the 20th century, which is a great century of philosophy, because there's really been made a lot of progress in essential parts of philosophy. We think of philosophy nowadays as a purely academic discipline, as this idea of the art of giving reasons, as a science of finding the right reasons. But my books focus on this other path in philosophy in the 20th century, namely figures who thought of philosophy as the art of transforming their own life and their existence. And um, it is important to me that remember that this part of philosophy always exists and has always been important to the entire treat. 
trade. Es, bueno, siempre, siempre es súper bonito escucharte, Wolfram. <ríe> siempre me emociono mucho con, eh, con algunas de estas, de estas frases que me voy apuntando porque eh, conviene recordarlas también. Y, pero hay algo que has dicho, eh, como yendo hacia atrás, que me, ha, que me ha llamado mucho la atención. Se sale un poco del guioncito que tenía preparado, pero eh, me apetece preguntarte. Lo has dicho. Eh, si no me equivoco, que, que, que muchas veces te sentías más escritor que filósofo eh, o que trabajabas más como escritor que como filósofo. Eh, a mí me hace gracia cuando en la prensa, yo soy periodista, entonces soy culpable de muchas cosas. Entonces me hace mucha gracia cuando en la prensa presentamos a escritores como escritor y poeta o escritor y filósofo, eh, como si no fueran parte de una misma cosa. ¿no? Eh, ¿por, qué, ¿Por qué te parece... Eh, eh, ¿Cuánto, ¿Cuánto de filósofo y cuánto de escritor eh, crees que tienes? Y, si, y cre, si crees que una nueva generación de escritores y filósofos, porque yo creo que hay eh, formas parte también ¿no? de una nueva generación de, eh, de divulgadores eh, y de, como decías, ¿no? de personas que piensan más en, el, en ese arte de la transformación que en, esa, eh, que en ese trabajo a veces tan oscuro y sistemático de la academia, eh, si, si crees que, que hay una posible reconciliación entre la palabra escritor y la palabra filósofo. Yes, uh, I think that's a very important question and it goes right to the heart of the question of what is philosophy, or what kind <laughs> of art is it? And it's, it's a very old question. It starts actually with the beginning of philosophy in the, in the Greek ages when Plato, for example, famously said that I'm a philosopher and as a philosopher uh, in, in his uh, greatest book, The State, Politaia, mm -hmm. he says, I would like to expel the poets uh, and the fiction writers from that republic because they do tell things that are not true. They create fictions. And of course, the interesting part about Plato's Republic, as many philosophy books, they tell fiction too, they create narratives. So the question is always, if you think of philosophy only as the art of giving the right argument or coming up with valid arguments and truthful conclusions, or if philosophy is also the art of finding the right descriptions, the right metaphor, the right narrative for our present situation. And I think both aspects of philosophy remain important and actually the great figures in the history of philosophy, be it David Hume, be it Plato, uh, be it Montaigne, Nietzsche, uh, even Wittgenstein and Heidegger, these people have always been also great writers. Uh, and the important link here, or uh, the deepest point I could make here is that philosophy is only about language. Philosophers do not dance, they do not heal, they do not paint. Whenever you do philosophy, all you do is you use words in a special manner, usually in the manner that other people haven't used before. You come up with a new vocabulary, with new ideas, with a new narrative. So I think this poetic aspect of philosophy, if you will, is extremely important. Um, so if I say that I'm a writer and a philosopher, I see myself in that vein, I also would like to stress the fact that there has never been any good philosophy, as far as I'm concerned, um, made by people who were not able to write well. So it's not only think straight, it's also write well, and of course also write in an appealing uh, uh, manner. And I think we can see in the history of philosophy that this craft of writing well is tremendously important, especially when philosophy tries to leave the academia and enter the public sphere. And uh, I feel that in present day philosophy, due to the educational system, to the, due to some pathologies in academic life, the art of writing well in philosophy has been lost, uh, and that's not a good sign. Um, sobre, um, sobre escribir bien, eh, otra cosa que tienen en común tus protagonistas eh, del Fuego de la Libertad es que eran todas grandes escritoras, al fin y al cabo, excepto poetas, que alguna vez también habíamos comentado, que los poemas de Hannah Arendt y de, y de Simone Weil a veces no eran del todo, del todo maravillosos, pero eso es otro tema. Eso se lo dejamos a los críticos de poesía. Eh, Bien. He dicho, he dicho algunos nombres, he dicho Hannah Arendt, he dicho eh, Simone Weil, está Simone de Beauvoir y está Anne Rand. Eh, ellas son las cuatro protagonistas de este El Fuego de la Libertad. 
eh, por si quien nos está escuchando no sabe muy bien de qué va eh, este libro, diré, me copiaré de Manuel Javois, que en la reseña del, del anterior, del Tiempo de Magos, dijo que literalmente eh, era eh, filosofía como un thriller, eh, preguntas eh, de metafísica como una buena serie de HBO. Eh, yo diré que esta puede ser también, o sea, que, que a mí realmente eh, este libro también me parece una especie de... Eh, bueno, novela de aventuras, por así decirlo, es una novela de aventuras de cuatro mujeres que son curiosamente cuatro de las eh, grandes pensadoras del siglo XX en sus años de iniciación, como comentábamos antes, y, y básicamente me gustaría, eh, me gustaría saber eh, por, qué, por qué las elegiste, cuál es la motivación y si siempre tuviste claro que las cuatro iban a ser, eh, bueno, iban a copo Coprotogan... Pro... Ah, no me sale el verbo. Iban a ser las coprotagonistas de, de esta novela de aventuras. Yes, well, you know, I try to write books about philosophers who not, not only procl proclaim, but embody their ideas, who live up to their own ideals and try to stand in for them. And that is, of course, of particular interest and particularly difficult in times that are dark times or very dark times. And uh, the book that you mentioned, uh, Fuego de la Libertad, or Feuer der Freiheit, as it's called in German, is uh, placed uh, in the 30s and 1940s, arguably the darkest age of modern civilization. And so these four figures um, face a similar fate. Three of them are Jewish. They fall under the totalitarian spell uh, in, in Europe uh, and the entire world. Uh, they are refugees and they are young women. And what is of particular interest to me, and this is why I chose them, they uh, dance around the same fire of questioning. They have one topic that they are most inter interested in, and that is the topic of freedom. Uh, and the question that they have to ask themselves in these times due to the existential pressure they are in is how is my freedom, my self-determination, my autonomy related to the fact that there are other human beings around me whose existence I cannot deny. And of course, in a time of totalitarian dynamics where society becomes more conform, there's more pressure, um, your identity, the group you belong to matters so much, the question of the other becomes not only a question of enabling my freedom, but also how does it limit or even uh, uh, limit, severely limit my freedom. And Hannah Arendt, Simone Weil, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, and Ayn Rand are four extremely important thinkers in the 20th century who are asking themselves the same question but gave radically different answers. And you see, this is where the writing comes in because I think of my books as polyphonic nonfiction books. And by polyphony, I mean that there's one important question in all of our life, lives, and that is the question of freedom and liberty. What do we mean by that concept? What does it mean to us and the ones we live with? And these four women give four radically different answers. And I present these answers Uh, in their existential context, but I would not like to judge and would not like to lead the reader to any idea of this is the right one or this is the wrong one, because I think that four answers given are equally valid, as it were. And to me, philosophy, and this is again a very old platonic image of philosophy, it's like being in a ship in the storm. You're reading, uh, for example, the concept of freedom of Hannah Arendt and you are going to this side. And then you might turn to Simon Bale's conception of freedom and you are in that storm of thinking on the other side. And I feel that um, practice oneself in this art of navigating through the storm of opinions, of reasons uh, and of our existence, it's a very important art and we should all try to learn it because I think it's the best service we can do to a free and democratic society. Um. Has, has hablado de las, de la, del peso de las identidades eh, en, sus, en sus búsquedas ¿no? diferentes, con diferentes eh, aproximaciones a esa pregunta sobre la libertad y me parece curioso ¿no? porque muchos años después, casi, casi 100 años después, eh, el término de políticas de la identidad es 
presente en, en todas las capas actualmente, ¿no? eh, de, en, en, tanto en tu país como en el mío, como en todas partes, ¿no? eh, la actualidad muchas veces está marcada por ese concepto, ¿no? por esa, eh, ya sea burlándose de él, ya sea eh, trabajándolo eh, eh, con intensidad, ¿no? parece que la identidad vuelve a ser uno de los grandes temas eh, del momento. Sí. Eh, ¿qué, qué, ¿Qué resonancias eh, de las vidas de, de ellas, qué resonancias de los temas que ellas investigaron crees que hay ahora? ¿Y cuál es nuestro deber también como escritoras, como pensadoras, como, eh, como ciudadanas, por, incluso ¿no? eh, como periodistas? Eh, ¿qué, ¿Cuál es nuestro deber? ¿no? Eh, eh, investigando o aproximándonos o, o intentando ir más allá de esos temas que ellas pusieron sobre la mesa. Pienso en el tema de la fe, eh, pienso en el tema de, del amor eh, y de las relaciones eh, eh, sexoafectivas, ¿no? que está muy presente en Simón de Beauvoir, por ejemplo. Pienso en el tema de la, del escepticismo y de la ironía, ¿no? y pienso también en el tema del feminismo. Eh, ¿cuáles, ¿Cuáles crees que deberían ser nuestras... Eh, bueno, qué... qué ¿Qué, ¿Qué podríamos hacer nosotros? ¿Qué podríamos aprender de ellas? ¿Y qué paso más deberíamos dar? Well, I, I hope all the aspects that you mentioned, and there are a lot, are somewhat present in the book. Uh, and it cannot be any other way because they are present whenever we do philosophy. Um, yeah. They are part of our existence. When we talk about the question of the other as the central question of this book, I think the other comes towards us or we come towards him or her in three ways. We can think of the event of love as a ma of major importance when we think of the others, because mm -hmm. we know that when we start to love someone else, we are not alone anymore in the world. And that's not only a beautiful thing, it's mostly beautiful, but it's also a scandal because we are not alone anymore, as you would think. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question of the other in terms of love is very important for all of these four philosophers. And as I think it's important for us, what does it mean to be free while you love? Is mm -hmm. love, a supreme kind of freedom and autonomy, or is it a supreme kind of not being free anymore because you are in a very special relationship to another human being that limits your own autonomy? So that's one question. The other question, and you mentioned that, is the question, what part of community am I thrown into the world? What is my identity in terms of language, in terms of nation, in terms of creed, in terms of political convictions? And this is of course what you what you refer to as the question of identity. And it's a huge question because as cultural existence, we human beings, we are a cultural existence. We cannot live without giving ourselves an answer to the question, who am I? Uh, and this question, it's not only up to us. And you were asking about, so to speak, the, the takeaway from the situation that these four heroes are in, in terms of their identity. And I think nowadays in our societies, we think of the question of identity in one way that we are free to choose whoever we want to be. That is only up to us to decide if we are this kind of person or that kind of person, if we have this creed or this background or this nation, and it is not so. The importance of the other is always there. It is other people who also determine who we are and how they see us. So I do see, and I also, um, I'm a bit sad to see it, uh, something that I would call a narcissism of identity right now. And this narcissism has to do with the idea that uh, certain subjects or persons have the illusion, and it's not more than an illusion, that they can freely choose who they want to be. Uh, and that is not so because the others have a say in that. And you can see that clearly with, uh, for example, Simone Weil or Hannah Arendt or Ayn Rand being a Jewish woman, um, they might not think of themselves as Jewish. They might not have the Jewish faith, but the others will tell them, you are that. And that is a factor in their life that they have to deal with. And uh, the same counts uh, uh, for, for today's, for example, if you make the decision, and this might be a controversial thing to say, that uh, I'm caught up in a male body, uh, but I'm a female. Um, that is a very difficult situation for any human being to be in. But just to say, I declare myself now a female is not good enough as long as you want to deal with other human beings. Uh, they also have a say in this. So I think uh, this, this dynamic of me and the other in terms of identity is of utmost importance in our everyday life. 
And the big illusion that I guess we fall into right now is that it's only to the subject, to the one ego to decide this for him himself or herself. And I hope you can feel writing, reading the book that there might be some problematic aspects to that idea. And of course, then there's a third big other um, that is very present in the book and that's the other of the state. Uh, and the power of the state and how it can influence uh, and limit our existence. And it was funny when I was writing the book uh, and also an uh, uncanny experience um, during this Corona lockdown that for the first time in my life and possibly in your life, I felt the real power of the state, mm -hmm. how it can really influence and limit uh, my everyday dealings. And this is of course something that these four women felt felt very strongly in the 1930s and 40s. So, so in that sense, I think of this book and the other books I write also of a kind of a, kind of a shall, shall we say, message in a bottle to our present day times, because many of the problems, uh, restrictions and fears these women were facing are also our problems and we should address them in a meaningful and hopefully also productive way. Yes, um... Como, como decía antes, yo me pasaría 20 horas escuchándote eh, todo el día, eh, toda la semana, eh, pero se nos va acabando el, el tiempo y quería hacerte la última pregunta, que va a ser una pregunta un poco egoísta, eh, porque eh, tú ya me conoces y yo ya te conozco un poquito y yo ya sé que, que de todas estas... Eh, heroínas, como las has llamado, o aventureras, o grandes eh, protagonistas ¿no? de, de, del pensamiento contemporáneo, hay una, <ríe> hay una con la que creo que sentimos especial, por la que creo que sentimos especial devoción, cariño o, o curiosidad, ¿no? que es precisamente la que tiene el final más trágico, por así decirlo, porque todas ellas, como bien decías, eh, lucharon contra muchas cosas, lucharon contra... Eh, esos, ese, ese, ese ahogamiento eh, de la época, ese ahogamiento del esta, de los diferentes estados ¿no? por los que pasearon eh, y ese ahogamiento también ¿no? de, de, de un machismo de, de época ¿no? contra el que ellas también se rebelaron. Y, pero, pero todas ellas, aún así, o casi todas ellas, tres de ellas tuvieron una vida muy larga, una producción muy larga, una, una posibilidad de un futuro eh, no menos doloroso, a veces mucho más gustoso ¿no? que, que, que los años que, que tú retratas aquí, eh, pero, pero precisamente el libro termina en 1943 con eh, la muerte de Simone Weil, ¿no? una pensadora que, como, eh, como te expliqué cuando viniste a Barcelona, me parece que está cada vez más de moda en España, eh, una pensadora que estamos leyendo muchísimo y que creo que además tu libro también ha ayudado a que aquí se, se, eh, lectores jóvenes y lectoras jóvenes eh, empiecen a descubrir y, y, a, y, a, y a descifrar mejor. ¿no? Me gustaría simplemente tal vez cerrar eh, esta conversación eh, con, 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 con que nos contaras alguna, alguna de, las, de las razones por las que supuestamente Simón Bail es tu favorita de todas ellas eh, y, que, eh, y si después de escribir El Fuego de la Libertad, la figura de Simón Bail te ha seguido acompañando. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. And it is true that the discovery of Simone Weil, and for me, it was a discovery because I was not very much familiar with her thought before writing the book, was, was a real shock and an opening for me. And I think many readers who read her feel the same way. It is not a human being that leaves you untouched and unchanged. And it is also true that I think of Simone Weil as really the forgotten giant, giant of the philosophy of the 20s century, um, not only because she is a very privileged mind and has a depth of thought that few human beings can match. She's also a very deep character. Uh, she's also an extremely empathetic human being. She's also extreme and she shows that philosophy is an extreme art uh, and should be handled with care at times. But if I really had one wish that I could uh, uh, express and there are no wishes a writer can express towards his or her readers but uh, if, if it would be the outcome of this book if you read it that you would feel inclined to read more of Simon Vale, I would be very happy I think her voice uh, should be heard in our times it is a voice that 
deals with uh, questions of transcendence and faith, which are very important questions. It is a voice that questions with, uh, that deals with um, justice and blindness. It is a voice that deals with the art of paying attention to things and not being distracted. Actually, Simon Weil thinks that the pathway to evil is distraction. And who would not think of our present times as times of distraction? And politically speaking, she is one of the great minds of the political left who turned against Stalinism, to, who turned against any kind of all too fixed ideology and not the last. Um, Simone Weil is probably the first thinker in the 20th century who invented what we could now call degrowth, the idea of growth, of economical growth and how it's, how it's possibly devastating the planet in ecological terms. So discovering Simone Weil is, uh, is I think a very necessary uh, and uh, would be a very positive thing for all of us, but one should also say, and you might agree with me, it is also something that you could not recommend lightly because once you are touched by that thinker, your life won't be the same anymore. So she has also to be handled with care, but care she needs and our attention she deserves. Muy bien, pues muchísimas gracias, eh, Wolfram. Insisto en que siempre, siempre es un placer eh, escucharte, siempre pienso que me encantaría además saber alemán para poder escuchar <ríe> todos eh, tus programas eh, y, todo, y todo el trabajo que haces de difusión eh, filosófica y literaria desde hace tanto tiempo y con, tanta, y con tanto cariño. Y para quienes nos han visto, pues el fuego de la libertad y tiempo de magos, creo que, que, bueno, que son dos buenas piedras para empezar eh, una casa, <ríe> una casa de, de ideas, de, de aventuras eh, y, de, y de, bueno, y de, de un, un, un buen incentivo ¿no? para, para atrevernos a pensar qué es lo que estamos intentando aquí. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a ti, Luna, y esperamos que la casa siga, siga creciendo. ¿no? Muchísimas gracias. Adiós. <ríe>